could tell the insurance company how long you had to live to the month. Life insurance companies have the day, the date, the time, the location, and the cause of death for hundreds of millions of people. Why are they not sharing this information? Let's ensure that we're about to get shadow banned. All of these conditions or what we call mental illnesses were actually not mental illnesses or physical conditions at all. Most of the people that are listening to this podcast are probably walking around at about 60% of their true state of normal. This database will likely never see the light of day. If it did, it would permanently change the face of humanity. I'll give you three things to just get out of your diet and your life permanently, because these are what we call forever chemicals. This, well, this is Gary Brecca. You might recognize Gary as the man who Dana White claims changed his life and revamped his health Yes, like Dana White, the founder of the UFC. Or you might recognize Gary after his recent feature on the Kardashians, with Kendall Jenner and Hailey Bieber touting their use of his health protocols. Or maybe, well, maybe you don't recognize Gary at all, because despite getting millions of views every time he posts, he's been shadow banned on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube over and over again for giving takes on health that the owners of those platforms, well, they don't really seem to like. But me? Well, I've been following Gary for years now. He's become one of the most famous quote unquote biohackers on the planet and even more intriguing to me than the thousands of testimonials that he's gotten from people saying he changed their life are the dark origins of how he started down this path. And the craziest part? He says this industry knows exactly what day you are going to die. You see, before Gary built one of the largest health businesses in the world, he worked in a totally separate industry, one which he says revealed to him some very sinister secrets that most of the world does not know about human life. So naturally, when I cross paths with Gary at Luke Belmar's Capital Club event in Spain this summer, I knew one thing. I had to get this man to sit down with me for a discussion on camera. Now, let me tell you guys, this was no easy task. Gary is quite literally larger than life. Everyone he meets just wants some of his time and he works with some of the biggest celebrities on the planet, but I got it done for you guys. And not only did I get it done, but Gary told me some things in this interview that absolutely blew my mind. By the end of this video, not only are you going to learn just who Gary is and what secrets he holds, but you just might walk away with an entirely new perspective on life. This is one of the many conversations that I've traveled the planet to bring exclusively to you guys. So before we jump into it, be sure you drop a like on the video and a sub on the channel if you want to hear more conversations with some of the wealthiest and most interesting entrepreneurs on the planet. And be sure to check out the link to my inner circle below if you want access to the uncut versions of all of these podcasts. But with that out of the way, without further ado, I present to you... Gary Brecca. What's going on guys and welcome back to the channel. It is Champ and it is time for more wealthy conversations and useful information. I am joined today uh, by somebody who candidly I'm humbled to be in the presence of. Uh, somebody who is a true legend in the biohacking community as well as a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Gary, if you can't tell, I'm a pretty big fan. Oh, that's great. Um, but for anybody watching this video who maybe does not know who you are, can I get a quick high-level intro to Mr. Gary Brecca? Sure. I'm, I'm a human biologist and a biohacker, a researcher. I spent about 20 years of my career in the mortality space. I was a researcher for the mortality industry and for big life insurance. And so big life insurance has a little known practice where they don't just put people on an actuarial curve, they actually predict your mortality to the month. And the team that I was associated with, if we got five years of medical records on you and five years of demographic data, we could tell the insurance company how long you had to live uh, to the month. And it seems astounding that that science could be that accurate, but it really is. And big life insurance is the only financial services industry in the world that will take 
that level of risk, 25 million, 50 million, $75 million worth of risk on a single variable, um, which is, you know, how many more months do you have left on earth? But long story short, you know, that industry, um, you know, I, I feel like I was almost brainwashed a little bit because I was, um, sort of led to believe that it was just data. There was nothing I could do to affect the outcomes. You know, I wasn't the cause of what was happening to these people, nor should I be part of the effect of what's going to happen to these people. And, you know, eventually I realized that there was human beings on the other side of these spreadsheets mm -hmm. and these were actually human lives. And the further I got into this study of the space of mortality, the more I began to realize that the reason why people are not living healthier, happier, longer lives are because of something called modifiable risk factors, simple changes and shifts that they could make that would dramatically change the trajectory of their life. And that the majority of the ailments that human beings are suffering from, these things that we chalk up to a consequence of aging, things like brain fog, weight gain, water retention, you know, poor sleep, lack of focus and concentration, gut issues, allergies, anxiety, depression, ADD, ADHD, all of these conditions or what we call mental illnesses were actually not mental illnesses or um, physical conditions at all. They were simple deficiencies in nutrients. And if we could hunt for the deficiency and find it, then we could put that raw material back into their body and just watch them thrive in ways that are astounding. You know, most of the people that are listening to this podcast are probably walking around at about 60% of their true state of normal. Mm. They have no idea how good normal really feels mm. when your short-term recall is is on point when you have clean clear waking energy when you've got sharp cognitive function when you're able to focus when you're able to task manage um, when you regulate the balance of neurotransmitters um, in your brain through proper supplementation and lifestyle choices so that you don't have to suffer from things like anxiousness and anxiety uh, mood numbness depressive episodes and it's not something that just affects old people Right. I mean, um, we're not just talking about chronic disease like Alzheimer's, um, dementia, things that we kind of think are reserved for the 65 and older crowd. Mm -hmm. We're talking about conditions that affect 18 to 35 year olds in mass, you know, that are affecting how well they concentrate, how well they prioritize tasks, um, their level of focus, um, their waking energy. And we can make simple shifts in our life. Um, we can look for these nutrient deficiencies. We can stop supplementing for the sake of supplementing, and we can actually start supplementing for deficiency. And this is when really magic things happen to human beings. Um, mm. I feel like that was a really long answer to no, <laughs> no, really, no, yeah, a really it was short great. question. That's, so. <laughs> no, that's why, we're, that's why we're here. And the thing that really stuck out to me is you mentioning that most people are walking around at half of their normal, right? And right. to just sort of set the tone here, the purpose of today's conversation is to have anybody who listens to this walk away with an understanding of what steps they can take oh, to absolutely. get to that normal. However, there was something you said at the beginning that I wanted to double click on, which is the fact that the insurance industry and these companies are in a position to be predicting people's life expectancy down to the month. Down to the month. And you know, like I know that they are not sharing this information with the public and it is a oh, rather no question. sinister industry. <clears throat> so before we get into the nitty gritty details of health and how to optimize, I want to talk a little bit about this industry and, and sure. ask you, why are they not sharing this information? Yeah. I mean, let's, let's ensure that we're about to get shadow banned for sure. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, when you think about life insurance, right. Um, it's different from any other financial services industry because there is no other um, venture capital firm, angel investor, hedge fund of any kind that would invest that kind of, um, capital on a single variable. Mm. I mean, if, if, if a large life insurance company puts $50 million worth of risk on your life or $25 million or even $10 million worth of risk on your life, only one thing matters, right? How many more months do you have left on earth? And 
I, I get attacked about this all the time. They say, well, if you could predict life expectancy to the month, you'd be Jesus or you'd be, you know, you'd have won a Nobel Prize. That's, I mean, that's very flattering, but it's, it's, it's absolutely not true. It's some of the most accurate science in the world because when you have large enough amounts of data and, you know, you're talking about tens of millions of lives in a database and information that no other database has. So, for example, life insurance companies um, have the day, the date, the time, the location, and the cause of death for hundreds of millions of people. And they can take that event and they can triangulate it back into that person's medical record, back into that person's demographic record and say, what are the patterns? What are the medications? What are the symptoms? What are the um, pathologies, the diseases, the, the types of conditions that eventually lead to early demise? And they also track the consequence of pharmaceuticals, right? Chemicals, synthetics, pharmaceuticals. And they say, okay, if this person starts corticosteroids, for example, which is a common prescription for arthritis, um, initially we see that these medications have an anti-inflammatory effect, but long-term we see that they actually erode the joint like a termite. Mm. And so we can see that somebody, for example, that was... Um, clinically deficient in vitamin D3, right? The most important nutrient in the human body, the sunshine vitamin. Mm -hmm. um, D3 is uh, colocalciferol. It's, it's, it's the only vitamin that human beings make on our own, mm. right? We don't need to eat. We don't need to, uh, to drink. We don't need to supplement. All we need to do is expose our skin to sunlight, right? We make it from sunlight and cholesterol. When you're deficient in this nutrient, eventually... It exacerbates, you know, a whole bunch of different ways, immune system, all kinds of issues, but eventually it will mimic the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. right? Diffuse joint pain, um, the soles of your feet and your ankles hurt when you get out of bed in the morning to go to the bathroom for the first time. It spreads to your neck, your hips, your low back. Eventually it becomes hard to make a really tight fist. Well, if you present those symptoms to the wrong physician, um, you know, not that the doctor is being sinister, but they're going to say, you know what, you've got rheumatoid arthritis. I'm going to put you on uh, prednisone, methylprednisone, or I'm going to put you on high, uh, corticosteroids, these, these steroids to lower inflammation. And now you've been diagnosed with a condition you don't have. Uh, you're taking a medication that you didn't need. And you have roughly six years and one day until that leads to a very high likelihood of having a joint replacement. And now after you get a joint replacement, your what's you called your ambulatory profile, how well you, you move, starts to decrease. And we know that sitting is the new smoking, right? Sedentary lifestyle is now the leading cause of all cause mortality. So now as we start to reduce your mobility, you can bring in all of the diseases that exacerbate with reduced mobility. So if you think about this scenario, and, and I could give you hundreds of these, um, you have somebody who has a nutrient deficiency. They're deficient in vitamin D3. Um, it presented like a, an autoimmune condition, which they didn't have. Um, so now you're taking a medication that you didn't need for a condition that you don't have, which caused a surgery that was not necessary, which led to a reduction in mobility, which brought diseases from your future very close to your, your present. And so this is what I'm talking about when I say that in this database, um, which will likely never see the light of day because... Which is a shame. It's such a shame because if it did, it would permanently change the face of humanity. It, it, it would upend modern medicine in a way that would be catastrophic because we would really begin to realize that chemicals and synthetics and pharmaceuticals are rarely the long-term answer. Mm -hmm. They're good for um, acute conditions, but managing chronic disease with um, chemical synthetics is always going to have detrimental side effect. Um, mm. And so my mission in life is to kind of um, get the message out there about, you know, the need for us to have a, a dashboard for our biome, to have a dashboard for our temple. Because, you know, most entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs, they know more about their business than they know about their bodies. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, I can, I, I mean, just walking around this conference, I'm really impressed with um, 
you know, there's a, the guys like yourself and, 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 and the women that are here, um, young go-getter entrepreneurs, burn the candle at both ends, succeeding in, in, in so many different areas of technology and social media. Um, and they know everything about their income statement and their balance sheet and their P&L. They're not. They have no idea where their blood sugar is. They have no idea what nutrient deficiencies they've got mm -hmm. in their body. Um, you know, they think that it's normal to feel anxiety. They think it's normal to have periods where they're just mood numb. They think it's perfectly normal not to sleep very well. Um, it's perfectly normal to, you know, rely on caffeine and other stimulants just to, just to get through the day. It's normal to have ADD or ADHD, and, and none of that is true. Mm. It's really quite incredible to me, actually, to be sitting across from somebody who has seen this data, by the way. Um, because like you said, were we able to present it to the public, everything would change. But luckily, I'm in a position to ask you questions. And luckily, you've made it your life mis mission, excuse me, to evangelize this to the world in one way or another. Yeah. So uh, what I want to talk about is how to move in the right direction, right? Because mm -hmm. you speak to people like myself, whether you're an entrepreneur or not we can agree that health is the single, you know, penultimate goal in life and the most no important question. thing because if you're dead, nothing else matters. Right. So, and if you're sick, you know, nothing else really yeah, matters. Yeah. Or even if you're mildly sick, yeah. everything What's the else old sucks. Chinese proverb, you know, um, a healthy man has a hundred wishes, you know, a, a sick man only has one. So I want to talk in a little bit more detail about an optimized daily routine for the regular individual from the time that I wake up to the time that I go to bed mm -hmm. at a high level, what should I be consuming and what should I be doing? So, you know, the, the body craves consistency, right? Our circadian rhythm, our biorhythms, um, our digestive system, um, even the cycle of growth hormone and, and hormones in the human body, testosterone, estrogen in a female, growth hormone in men and women, um, the cycle of cortisol and melatonin. These things, the body really craves consistency and routine. And so if you can develop a really good morning routine, um, I mean, I'll give you my morning routine. Um, I do it every day. I think we did it together this morning. And I feel great. Yeah, with about, with about 50 or 60, 60 yeah. guys out there. <laughs> There's 60 more people than, than you. Yeah, yeah. So you. 60 people joined us this morning. It was amazing. Um, and, and it's really simple because then what happens is your body starts to lock in to that um, as its way of deciding, okay, this is, this is morning. And now I know the difference between morning and night. So um, I wake up in the morning. The very first thing I do is I, um, I walk down my hallway. I drink um, 10 ounces of hydrogen water. Um, if you don't um, you know, want to spring for a hydrogen water machine, get a basic water filter at your, at your grocery store at a minimum that filters out fluoride and chlorine. Those are two things that are found in, in toxic levels in all municipal water supplies. They're very easy to get out. Um, it's not a big investment. You get a Brita water filter. You can get any kind of water filter that filters out fluoride and chlorine. Minimum 10 ounces of water within 15 minutes of waking. Most of the population is so chronically dehydrated that they've actually lost the sensation for thirst. Most people listening to this podcast can go an entire day without drinking an ounce of water and their body will not remind them to drink Insane. they won't get thirsty Insane. yeah Insane. it's 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 crazy you know because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this happens gun. every time i talk about hydration it's like the power of suggestion like off camera they're grabbing uh, water over here too you know <laughs> sure I'll, I'll have one too <laughs> why not yeah it, it um, might as well so first thing is 10 ounces of hydration and then um i love Dave, david goggins and david goggins method because he solves procrastination with action yes. and so so you just get up, robotically you go, you get 10 ounces of water, you whack back 10 ounces of water, and now immediately get outside onto your balcony, onto your front porch. Um, you know, there's, if you're in a hotel, just open up the doors, open up the windows, um, and take a seat and do eight minutes of breath work. Because the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. 22 years of clinical research in the mortality space, I do not recall a single disease etiological process, um, and I would challenge any physician to take issue with me on this, that did not have its roots in a lack of blood oxygen or was not exacerbated by um, a lack of blood oxygen. Um, every elevated emotional state that a human being can feel 
passion, elation, joy, arousal, libido, you know, all these hell yeah, I won the lottery emotions. They all require oxygen as a part of their molecular structure. So in other words, the reason why no human being has ever woken up laughing is because from, from deep sleep, you can't go from deep sleep to laughter because you don't have the oxidative state. You can go from deep sleep to anger because anger doesn't require any oxygen. Mm. So first you hydrate. Um, and there are lots of different um, um, breathing techniques. I use a Wim Hof style of breathing. Make sure that you're seated or lying down. Never do it in the shower. Never do it while you're driving. Never do it in a swimming pool um, because you can get lightheaded. Um, some people can even, even pass out. Start by three rounds of 10 breaths. Work your way up to 15, 20, and eventually three rounds of 30 breaths. Very simple with a breath hold in between. Takes you eight minutes now you've hydrated and you've oxygenated the body if you can you want to take your shoes off and contact real uh, the real surface of the earth if you can't um you should look to investing in something called a pemf mat a pulse electromagnetic field mat if you want to know the one that i use it's on my instagram but there's plenty of these that are you know widely widely available what a pmf mat does is it mimics the um the grounding the, the the magnetic field of the earth and what this will do is it will change the polarity in the body it will slightly shift the blood to being slightly alkaline you know the ph range of the blood is very narrow and it will it will repolarize the surface of our cells so that they're all free floating and moving around right ancestrally this was a normal routine for us wake up with the sun, I'm getting sunlight exposure, I'm already contacting the surface of the earth, I start moving and I'm breathing. Um, and, and because we control our environments and we, we were designed to spend 85% of our time outdoors and now we spend 96% of our time indoors, we sort of flipped our, our, our basic ancestral physiology. So you hydrate, you do breath work, you expose your skin to sunlight, you contact the surface of the earth or you lay on a, um, uh, a PMF mat. And then when you're done, if you go to the gym or whatever the balance of your routine is, that's great. Um, when you come home and you shower, when you finish showering end with a one to three minute ice cold shower, mm. um, so many benefits to cold water immersion, vasoconstriction, the release of something called cold shock proteins. Um, there's even indications that you can release survival genes called sirtuins. Dr. David Sinclair talks about these all the time. These are just natural ways to tap into your physiology and this process called hormesis, which is stress, stress and strengthen. Um, in, and you can do them. The reason why I'm giving you these um, tactics is because you can use them in a hotel. You can use them when you travel. I do them on an airplane. I mean, you want to get some really funky looks in the first class section of an airplane, start doing breath work in the bathroom every hour on the hour, <laughs> which I, which I do. If I'm on a long day flight, um, I'll go into the bathroom and I'll do, you know, 25 deep breaths. I mean, God only knows what they think I'm doing in there, but, uh, I don't care. I'll come out with a big smile on my yeah, face, you know? <laughs> I, I, can I ask you a little bit of a sort of off the wall question? As yeah, it sure. To breath work? So I, I ask this because in recent years, there's been, you know, a big sort of advent of psychedelic use, right? Mm -hmm. and, and spirituality and things of this nature. But when we talk about breath work, it brings to mind just how, at least in my opinion, uh, much people underestimate the true power of breath and its ability to alter our perception of the world around it's, us. We underestimate the power of walking, just so many things. Right. So, and I think that many people um, who would traditionally attribute perhaps some very intense experiences only to drug usage would be able to experience that with simple breath work. So what I wanted to ask you is... Have you ever had an intensely emotional or even psychedelic experience linked purely to, to breath work and oh, controlling your breath? no question. Um, I've been to some breath work workshops that would, in my opinion, rival any kind of psychedelic experience or, um, you know, I've, I've, I've never, I've never 
done some of the, you know, some, some of the psychedelics like ayahuasca and what have you. And I know that lots of people swear by those. Um, so I don't have a direct experience to correlate it to, but I can tell you, you have almost an out of body experience. Um, if you have a good breath work guide that can take you through getting into a deep theta state, meditative state and coming out of that state with breath work, it is astounding how tied to breath work human beings really are. Um, you know, an average human being in the, throughout the course of a 24 hour day will manufacture a hundred gallons of intracellular water. And when I say that to people, they're like, there's no way that's possible. I only drink a half a gallon of water a day. How does my body make a hundred gallons of water? Well, we make water in the human body the same way we make it in space. You take two hydrogens, one oxygen, you create a water molecule. This water molecule is made right outside of the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. And then it's drawn into the mitochondria and it's chopped up for energy. So a lot of the gases, a lot of the air that we breathe is actually converted to liquid and then converted to energy in the human body, right? This is the process that it goes through in, in something called the Krebs cycle. And so if I want to fuel my body, I can fuel my body with oxygen. I can fuel my body with breath work. Um, you know, in fact, if you, not to bore your audience to tears, but human beings are not powered by the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink. We're powered by one single energy source. It's called ATP. Mm -hmm. It's an energy source that is made inside your cell in a little organelle called the mitochondria. 10% mm -hmm. of your body weight is mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this little battery, mm -hmm. right, it uses gases and, and vitamins and nutrients and essentially creates this molecule ATP and then we perceive that as energy. So imagine a motor inside this mitochondria and every time this motor makes one revolution, it has two choices. It can either create two units of energy, two ATP, or it can create 36 units of energy. 36 ATP. So you mean to tell me that the same revolution, one turn, either creates 16 times more energy or 16 times less energy. And that's exactly what I'm saying. So what determines whether or not it's 16 times more efficient or 16 times less efficient? The presence of oxygen. So just, just marinate on that for a moment, 110 trillion mitochondria in our body, 10% of our body weight has a 16 fold step up in energy production simply by the presence of oxygen. And now you're deep breathing. See all this, all this, uh, <laughs> uh, sub, you know, subconscious, um, effect you're drinking, you're, you're breathing. Um, you know, the reason why sedentary lifestyle is the leading cause of all cause mortality is because we are slowly reducing the oxidative state of the body. You know, when I very first joined uh, in this mortality team, and it was a team of very smart individuals, PhDs, MDs, you know, statisticians, um, actuaries, uh, it's very hard for us to agree on anything. The one thing we agreed on was that all human beings leave this earth the same way. We all die of exactly the same thing. It's called hypoxia lack of oxygen to the brain. So if that is the end destination for all human beings, then we started there at hypoxia and worked our way backwards. And what we realized was really profound because if all human beings die of a lack of blood oxygen, the sad thing is that we think of death as an event, gunshot wound, a bus, a stroke, a heart attack. But the truth is, that every single one of us is on a hypoxic curve. Mm -hmm. We are either managing oxygen well or we are managing oxygen poorly. Mm. The more poorly you're managing oxygen, the faster you're accelerating towards the grave. Mm -hmm. The earlier the onset of all cause disease pathology and mortality. The, the better you're managing oxygen, the more resistant you are to all forms of pathology disease. Um, and so that's why I think that morning routine incorporating breath work and uh, cold showers and you know, hydrogen water um, and sunlight exposure and grounding is so important. Um, for people that really want to go next level, springing for one of these genetic tests, which will cost you somewhere between $200 and $900 um, to get a methylation test once in your life. If you have kids, you can do it as soon as they can chew and swallow. And now you know exactly what your body's deficient in. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, 
you know, 40%, statistically speaking, 40% of your audience that's listening to this right now suffers from some form of anxiousness, anxiety, um, or ADHD. And if you look at these conditions, um, they are not the conditions that we describe them. So for example, attention deficit disorder, it's not an attention deficit at all. It's actually an attention overload disorder. People that have ADD or ADHD do not lack the ability to pay attention. They lack the ability to pay attention to so many things. And why does this happen? It's because in their brains, a category of neurotransmitters called catecholamines is rising. And so what's happening is they are creating thought at a faster rate than they are dismantling it, which makes their mind very clouded. And so modern medicine says, okay, if the mind is racing, let's put an amphetamine into the body to race the central nervous system to match the pace of the mind. That is a very poor choice. What if we knew how to regulate these catecholamines, things like methylfolate, the complex of B vitamins, certain amino acids, and we put those nutrients into the human body. And now I begin to create thought at the same rate that I dismantle thought. And now the mind clears. And so this attention deficit disorder, which is actually an attention overload disorder, eviscerates. And this is something that, that you have seen treated on, on multiple Oh, no question. Seen. Thousands of times. Um, thousands, literally thousands of times. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on publishing this data now in one of the largest running longevity uh, studies in the world. And we're going to take 27,000 or so um, um, patients that we've treated and where we have blood work and we have this gene test. And all we did was supplement those patients for deficiency, right? Simple things, methylfolate, um, uh, methylcobalamin, complexes of B vitamins, trimethylglycine, just m m amino acids. We put back into their body what was deficient. And then we pulled real measurable things like thyroid hormones, um, inflammatory markers, uh, kidney filtration rates, um, uh, immune system profiles. And we actually watched the entire biome change. And it looked like they were medicated. But the truth is we just restored this natural process of, of methylation. So I think I already know the answer to this question. But if this is the case, and we have documentation of this working, why does so much of the world believe everything that we've talked about today to be false? Well, think about it this way. Um, next time you go to your doctor, um, and you know, when we have certain conditions, for example, that run in families, like high blood pressure, hypertension, or um, hypothyroid, poor thyroid function, or hypercholesterolemia, or hypertriglyceridemia. We have all these conditions, even depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol addiction. They run in families, okay? Because they run in families, we have assumed in many cases that they are genetically inherited diseases. So for example, let's say, and I'm, I'm making this up, but let's say in a, in a few years, you start having high blood pressure. You go to your family practitioner and he says, well, you know, your father had high blood pressure and your grandmother on your mom's side had high blood pressure. You have genetically inherited hypertension. Well, the next time they say that, ask them, well, you know, we've mapped the entire human genome. We know every gene in the human body. What gene did I inherit from my grandparent or my father or my mother that's causing me to have that disease? And watch their face go blank. Because in most cases, that gene does not exist, which means that that disease does not exist. What you inherited in many cases is not a disease. What you inherited is the inability to refine a raw material that caused a deficiency, which led to that condition. So take hypertension, for example. Um, just because it runs in families doesn't mean that disease hypertension was passed on. What it means is the inability to refine a certain raw material. So um, about 85% of these cases have an elevated amino acid in their blood called homocysteine. If you can't break this amino acid down, it rises. When it rises, it irritates the lining of the blood vessel. When you irritate the lining of the blood vessel, it clamps down. Now think about what happens if I make the pipes smaller in, in a closed system. This is a closed system, 
right? If I make the pipe smaller, what happens? Pressure goes up. And then you go to your doctor and you're like, well, you have high blood pressure, but your grandfather or your grandmother your, or, or your father had high blood pressure, so you inherited hypertension. Not true in many cases. Um, if you put amino acids like trimethylglycine back into the body, it begins to metabolize homocysteine. The vascular system relaxes, pressure returns to normal. You have 63,000 miles of blood vessel in your body. Doesn't take much narrowing to drive pressure up. And I could go through hundreds of conditions like this where we chalk it up to a disease or a pathology and it's a nutrient deficiency. It's a deficiency in methylfolate. And, and this is because you know our, our food supply in, in many cases is not only poison, but it also is just devoid of nutrients, mm. right? I really take issue with people that say you can get everything that you need just by eating a whole whole food diet. That is very, very, very rarely the case. Okay. This is a great transition because I also want to talk about the things that we should not be consuming. We, we've talked in pretty great detail about adding the things that are missing, right. but my assumption is that many people watching this video unknowingly are consuming things that are actively very detrimental to their health. So when you look at the average person's diet, day-to-day -day behaviors, mm -hmm. what are some of the key things that you see them consuming or that you see them doing that are actively poisoning their health? Okay, so I'll give you three big ones, right? Because um, we could go way down that rabbit hole, but I'll give you three things to just get out of your um, diet and your life you know, permanently, which will, um, because these are what we call forever chemicals. Mm -hmm. There are certain things like, people talk about the impact of sugar. I'd rather people be eating sugar because the body can get rid of it then be eating things with glyphosphates um, and fluorides and chlorines because the body has a very difficult time, sometimes never gets rid of it. So let's talk about three things that have to go. Um, the first thing that has to go is um, the consumption of tap water. I mean, you have to stop all of the consumption of tap water or you have to filter at a minimum, filter the chlorine and the fluoride out of the tap. And why is that so important? Because fluoride has, is, is a known neurotoxin. Um, there's a recent study that was just released last year, um, um, and it was published through the Freedom of Information Act, and this is our CDC, our FDA. Um, and they found not only zero benefit of fluoride in protecting teeth from tooth decay, but they identified fluoride as a neurotoxin and they found a direct inverse relationship between the amount of fluoride consumption and the IQ of prepubescent children, meaning young children. And they looked at municipalities all over the country and the higher the fluoride concentration had it directly the lower the IQ. So the more fluoride you consume, the lower your, um, your IQ. Um, fluoride is one of those forever chemicals that can take um, months, if not years, to rid itself from uh, from the tissue. If you actually look at the back of a toothpaste um, uh, tube, it will tell you that if you swallow the toothpaste to contact poison control, well, the amount of toothpaste that you would swallow, the amount of fluoride that you would swallow in a single um, you know dose of toothpaste, is a fraction of what you would drink in a day just by drinking your own tap water. But they don't tell you to call poison control for drinking tap water. So very simple and very inexpensive to fil filter your tap water. I mean, you can spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars on a whole home fil filtration system. You can get an echo water filtration system, which is what I use, which is about thirty five hundred dollars, or you can get a simple water filter from your grocery store. But at a minimum, you got to filter the fluoride out. So fluoride has to go. The second thing is seed oils. Um, you know, there's a lot of chatter about this on the internet, and I want to be clear that I'm not saying that seed oils are bad for you. I'm saying industrial processed seed oils are bad for you. So they usually do not start as a toxic compound. But if you look at how seed oils are processed, um, when they press, for example, canola oil, um, you press canola and it comes out very gummy. So they degum it with something called hexane, which is a known neurotoxin. Um, once it's degummed, they heat it to 405 degrees. This turns the oil rancid. Um, and so now you have a rancid neurotoxic oil um, that you now need um, to deodorize. And they use something called sodium hydroxide, which is a known carcinogen. And then very often after that, it's the, they're not clear, so they'll bleach it often with chlorines. So now you use chlorine, sodium hydroxide. You've used um, 
um, hexane and you've heated the oil to be rancid. So you need to get seed oils out of your life and replace them with five oils. You need coconut oil that you can cook with, um, grass-fed butter, a ghee butter. By the way, vegans and vegetarians can use ghee butter, even though it's an animal product, it's clarified, um, or tallow, um, and you use those to cook. And then an avocado oil and an olive oil, extra virgin olive oil at room temperature. That's it. That's all you need. You can make every single recipe under the sun with those. You will dramatically lower your toxic load by getting seed oils and fluoride out of your um, bloodstream. And then the last thing is non-organic fruits. If you eat fruit, and I'm a fan of fruits, I prefer fruits that end in berry, but if you eat fruit, that is the one place in your budget where you have to step up and, and buy organic. Fruits absorb pesticides and herbicides, insecticides through the skin. Um, so they have a much higher concentration than, than other foods. Um, I, I actually was shadow banned a few months ago because I talked about a, uh, a, a study that came from um, the EPA that, that took non-organic strawberries, put them in a commercial press, um, and they took the juice from those strawberries, and the pesticide content was so high that they could use it to respray the crop. So there's two, th there's, there's two ways that you need to think about nutrition. You can either filter poisons and toxins and chemicals before they enter your body, or you can put them in your body and let your body be the filter. Those are your two choices. So I would prefer to filter them before they come in, right? The last thing I said I would give you three, I wanna give you four is GMO foods. Um, you've got to go non-GMO. And the reason for this is that genetically modified um, uh, organisms were not genetically modified to increase yield. They were genetically modified to be resistant in most cases to glyphosate poison. They realized that when they spray crops with glyphosates that it would, of course it would kill the insects, um, but it was also killing the seed. So they genetically modified the seed, but when they did this, they also genetically modified it in a way that the body doesn't recognize. And so you get virtually no nutrition from genetically modified foods. You know what's very interesting is I actually attended college as well. I was a biology major in college. and we Oh, were, were you? Yeah. Oh, we so were, you're all about the Krebs cycle. Yeah, like well, that's why I was laughing you. earlier. I'm like bringing back memories. <laughs> and, and, we were, and we were taught ad nauseum that there was no issue with GMO foods that, you know, mm. it was propaganda against GMO foods. So it's interesting to hear, it's interesting to hear your perspective. Well, because they didn't, what they tested was the nutritional content. So for example, um, it's the same way the supplement industry is regulated, right? Um, we, um, if, if I'm going to uh, manufacture vitamin C, um, and I say there's a thousand milligrams of vitamin C in this capsule, right? The, Truth and disclosure says there has to be a thousand milligrams of vitamin C in that capsule. But if you absorb 90% or 2%, that's not regulated, right? So right. this is why fillers and binders and plant sterols and all kinds of things that cheap manufacturers use, can, can, they can make an advertisement on a label that says, hey, there's so many milligrams of this vitamin, this nutrient, this mineral, this amino acid, but 90% of it passes through and goes right into the toilet. This is the same with GMO foods. You can, you can analyze the nutrient content, but what you really should analyze is the absorbed, you know, the amount of absorption the body has. Because if the body doesn't recognize it as a metabolite, it can't use it. It's like swallowing a piece of plastic. It's just eventually gonna pass through and go out the other end. You're not going to pull nutrients out of it. And optimal health is about the presence of the good, not, not the, absence the absence of the bad. Yes. I mean, if you, if you have a good whole food diet, whether you're vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, keto, paleo, or what have you, raw food, if you have a good whole food diet, um, you know, less distance from the soil to the table, um, you hydrate adequately, and you do some of those things I was referring to before, you dramatically lower your toxic load. So the presence of the good, not the absence of the bad. So can I still drink alcohol? Can I smoke so, and be healthy? How does that work? Well, here's, here's what's really interesting about smoking and drinking and vaping and all of those things. If you take, um, if you take someone who lives a sedentary lifestyle, um, they're highly sedentary and they smoke or they drink, um, or they vape or they do the obvious things that we know that are, that are very bad for you. Um, 
the impact on their mortality is dramatic. It becomes what's called a comorbidity factor. Mm -hmm. It is a multiplier of how fast it will harm you. People that exercise over their lifetime. So um, someone that exercises and smokes, and I am by no means condoning smoking, but someone that exercises and smokes um, will outlive somebody who does not exercise and doesn't smoke. Someone who lives a sedentary lifestyle but also doesn't um, smoke. I mean, mobility is such a huge part of longevity. Um, obviously, smoking, vaping is even worse than, than straight tobacco because of the really? amount of... Oh, yeah, because they... Remember, the, the nicotine concentration is what's regulated. Um, the poison and additive concentration is not. So all of those um, flavorings, you know, pineapple mango and all of these different flavors that they use um, are really, really toxic chemicals that actually call the immune system to the lungs, right? And you start a fight in your lungs with your own immune system. Um, so, uh, you know, now we know that there is no safe level of alcohol consumption. So if you're going to consume mm -hmm. alcohol, you know, just know that there are no health benefits to alcohol. And um, there is, you know, only risk. Alcohol becomes something called acetylaldehyde, mm -hmm. which is a toxin, neurotoxin. Um, so, you know, you want to limit or completely stop alcohol consumption. I understand that that doesn't fit most lifestyles. So if you are going to drink, um, you know, start with tequilas, uh, then clear alcohols, then full-bodied red wines, then everything else. Um, but uh, um, we know now that there's no safe level of alcohol, just like fluoride. Why tequila? You know, there's it, an interesting, um, uh, the way that the agave plant is, is processed. So alcohol usually comes from grains, potatoes, hops, wheat, mm -hmm. barley. So it comes from grains. So it has high amounts of folic acid in it, which is a man-made chemical. And it also turns to sugar very, very quickly. And it converts to acetylaldehyde very quickly. Mm. The agave plant is like, um, think of it as a very slow burning sugar when it converts from alcohol in the body. So for some reason, um, the agave plant, the, liver, the way that the liver processes it, is a very, very slow process to spike your sugars Understood. and to spike this acetylaldehyde. I'm going to tell you something. So it's the healthiest of alcohols, I'm if you will. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> this... That sentence right there, I promise you, just literally altered the trajectory of the future alcohol consumption the rest of my entire life. I love, yeah. I love tequila, but I, I always, I don't know, I never drank it. I thought it was like, and I don't drink very often, but yeah. any time from now on, it will certainly be tequila. Now, one last question for you, Gary. Sure. Because I try and keep these conversations as actionable as possible. Yeah. If I am, if I just watched this whole video, we're about to wrap up, what is one thing that I can do as soon as I shut this video, leave a like and subscribe to the channel, of course, because the conversation was so useful, right. and shut my laptop, what's one thing that I can do today um, to put me in the right direction? I would say take 20 or 25 minutes right now, either go to my Instagram or get on YouTube and look up Wim Hof breathing, look up this style of breath work. Um, it is a four to eight minute routine that will completely change the trajectory of your life. It's free. You can take it with you anywhere in the world. Um, it's simple. It's because it's free and it's simple and it's accessible. We don't give it as much credit as it deserves. So if I was only going to do one thing, um, and that's what I would do. I would actually learn to do simple breathwork routine and I would put it, I would incorporate it into my life every single day like clockwork and i would never ever 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 miss not once not ever amazing amazing it's, awesome. it's great actionable advice you guys if you've enjoyed this conversation be sure you drop a subscription you stick around the channel gary it's been an absolute pleasure having oh, you this on this was great um yeah, this was great. I've learned a lot from you today, and you. I appreciate you giving us your time. I know you're an incredibly busy person, and you have a keynote speech to give. Yeah, in about in an hour. Like an hour. <laughs> so thank you so much for your awesome, time. Awesome, brother. And uh, we can wrap it up there. Amazing. It's just science. It's just science. <laughs>